thank you all for coming. This is the, probably the best attended one we've had yet, and we've had some pretty well attended uh, um, forums over the last several months. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about livable communities. I know Tracy touched on this a little bit. Livable communities, and I left my notes in front of me, didn't I? And you know, this after my boss was just praising me for seeming so organized the other day. Um, livable communities, simply put, it's just a place where everyone can age successfully, um, defined as living as vital a life as possible with the opportunity to flourish in the community. Um, a livable community offers health and supportive services, transportation and mobility options, community and economic development, public safety, cultural volunteer, lifelong learning, and employment opportunities. And um, most notable, I think, with this group is affordable and appropriate housing. Um, Livable Community has a website. That's what we're really showcasing here in this slide. Livablecommunity.org. Um, very forward-thinking members of our group were able to get that domain. The concept of livable communities has become a bigger and bigger concept. You'll see AARP doing the livability index, for instance. This website has a lot of great information, events that are coming up in the area. The service directory is tremendous as far as trying to find what providers, what resources are available. So I recommend um, getting that information. There are rack cards out behind Ty um, that have that website on there. So help yourself to any of the giveaway stuff back there too. Um, our housing action team, you've kind of touched on this pretty well, but this is specifically some of the things that the housing action team is really trying to, to look at the key components, affordability, accessibility, universal design, home safety, availability, and housing options. The big partners for um, the housing action team, the Greater Iowa City Area Home Builders Association. Did I finally get it, Carol? Yep. <laughs> it's only taken me like four forums to do it. And uh, the Iowa City Area Association of Realtors um, have been real big partners with the housing action team. And some of the members, this is just a, a snapshot of a few of them. This is a really great group of folks. Um, represented through the cities, di different service organizations, community volunteers, um, and members of those great organizations that we just mentioned. Um, they developed an aging in place checklist. We've kind of talked about that in some of the past forums, but if you're interested in seeing that aging in place checklist, you can find it on the website. There's also copies of it back by Ty. Lots of information in the back of the room today. Um, so without further ado, I think I want to make sure we get done by 1 o'clock, and I know people might have questions for all these folks. What we're going to do is we're going to let each one of them present. At the end, we'll take questions um, for whoever or all of them if you want, and uh, we'll try and keep on our time frame. So first up today is Kim Peterson with Caring Transitions. Hi, my name is Kim. Um, I want to go over... Um, our seat here, I'll just keep going here, I'll show you. Five things to know about senior move managing. Um, what you need to know is it's a lot easier to hire one. Um, <laughs> if you, my thing is for people, is if you, you know, if you wanna take on the task to do your move, sometimes it is very emotional and, and hard to get through things because you got a lot of memories. Um, it's sometimes easier to hire someone from the outside to come in and help you out. So everyone's, there's a lot of great ones out there. Um, everybody might work a little bit different. So when you sit down um, for your consultation, maybe just talk with them about some of the things we'll talk about here. Um, but it's, it is worth it. And I think I feel like it's kind of not a new thing, but it's, it's definitely been booming here lately. It takes away a lot of stress and, and you honestly, you walk away and you're like, that wasn't so bad. And some people have even said that was actually really fun. So pretty cool. So the one thing to expect, I feel like I'm leaning. Um, make sure that you know professional and staffed and trained, certified and insured. Just maybe ask some questions before you get started. Because you want to make sure that everything in your home, um, the, if any, we're touching them, that they're insured um, and bonded. Um, and so that's important. But what we take care of is your space planning. 
that's actually the huge part, um, just because there's so many things in your home that you're, you don't know what you want to take. Um, so it's a good thing to do is do your space planning. So have someone come in, measure your furniture, decide what things you love and what things you, question mark, can live without. But if there's room, you can take it. So what we like to do, and, and other ones as well, move managers, is put it on a floor plan. So literally, we would measure all the furniture that you would love to bring over, measure the floor plan, the exact floor plan that you're moving into. We know where the outlets are. We know where the TV connections are. We know the space between the windows and the walls. We know everything. So when we go in, we know the drawers in your kitchen, how much the depth of them and the width. So it takes all that away from you. So honestly, what you do is what fits on that floor plan is pretty much what's is going to fit. So there's no surprises. You don't have that moving anxiety. You know, OK, this is it. And then you have time to decide, OK, let's have the kids come in and take this and this. And you kind of know what's going to fit and what's not. That's like the biggest part. And honestly, it, once you know and you see it on paper, it, it becomes easier to accept. And then you can kind of take step two. Then it's packing day. Um, and I'm jumping a little bit. And you guys, if you have any questions afterwards, I'll be here because there's a lot more in between all these steps, but to make it easier, like tagging things and putting post-it notes on them and you know what things you want to keep and, and not. But these ladies might talk about it as well. So anyway, um, the pack, we have a pack day. So a lot of times what we'll do is um, pack you one day and move you the next day. Everybody's different though, so your move manager. So when you talk with them, check and see what their plan is. But we have everything identified. Some people know exactly what they want to bring. I'm talking like kitchen, bathroom, if you don't know what those are, no big deal. We had a lady have her breakfast, and then she said, I'll just be with you when I get finished. And we're like, okay, we'll put boxes together. <laughs> and we did it one by one, and we, I did this again last week. So you can do it. Um, so my part is you can plan or you don't have to. So it's up to you as far as where you're at. So we pack you the one day, and then the next day you get moved. And then by that day of your move, by 5 o'clock or before, you're actually Everything is put away, all boxes are put away, pictures are on the walls, clean sheets, everything is done. Um, we take pictures, whoever's packing up that day will take pictures of everything and where it's at. If it's sitting on the side table, what's in the kitchen, are your glasses up, are they down? Um, we seriously like take pictures of everything where it goes. So when you get moved, I even took pictures yesterday of clothes. I want to make sure the clothes were put exactly where she had them. But so everything, when you get there, we won't want you to be stressed out because you're like, can't find something for two months. So when we take the pictures, the person that packs it is the person that puts it away. So you have any issues on that as well. But if there's anything you can't find, we say call, don't even bother to look, and we'll tell you exactly where it's at. So that is our resettlement. And then, um, we have resources, so these folks here will help you with, with everything else that's, on, that's going on after the fact. Um, and I have a bunch of information I said in the back, but, but honestly, for a senior move manager, it's good to at least, if you're not sure, just, you know, some people offer free consults, just take them up on it. Who cares if you don't use them, at least use it, you know, pick their brain a little bit <laughs> and figure out what to do and not do. Um, but it is really easy because we've had ladies like have coffee and someone called and said, I thought you're moving today. She was like, I am. They're doing a great job. You know, so it, so the thing is, you know, it doesn't have to be. It's really, really emotional. It's hard. I get it. That's why it's good to have someone that does this and can help you give you hugs along the way and, and get you where you're going. All right. Well, I have the task of talking about sorting through your stuff and some creative ways of passing on your treasures. Uh, I've done a lot of research on this. I am not an expert on it by any means, but I love to watch, uh, read about anything like this. Uh, having downsized my parents three times from a large farm down to a two-bedroom apartment, down to a one-bedroom apartment, down to assisted living. It was quite an ordeal watching them part with things as they went along. The biggest part is it is so emotional. And I went through this last year, moving from a house I'd lived in for 30 years. So I have firsthand experience. You, it's a roller coaster ride. And you just have to realize your memories are always going to stay with you. And if you're like me and the brain's fading out a little bit, write them down. Do a book. As we were going through things moving, our children, uh, 
are in different places. I have other family members, brothers, and everything. I would take a picture of my phone, send it off to them, and say, I'd write a brief description as to why this was an important treasure. And things they had turned down when my parents downsized, they went, well, I didn't know the story behind that. Yeah, keep that for me. And it's amazing, and it's a great bonding experience for families. Um, the year after my father passed away, my son uh, was living in the same town as my mother. And he went over there three times a week. And he started going through cupboards and things with her. And she would tell him stories. So things mean a lot more when they're stories. Now, the biggest thing is our kids don't want our stuff. <laughs> And I can see why. Uh, my kids travel all over. They are going to have multiple jobs where, well, I had a lot of jobs too, but most people in our age bracket didn't have that many jobs. We only worked a few places. We stayed there for a long time. We didn't move that much. So we accumulate a lot of things. Antiques are not what they were. I just got rid of a round oak table and four mission oak chairs for $200. And was lucky I got that. I started it out at three. <laughs> and, and so it's hard to see these beautiful pieces of furniture that no one wants, but they went actually went to the people who bought our house. So it was much easier to know that they were going to stay in the house. Uh, so sorting is kind of hard. It is an emotional roller coaster. You have to break it down into four categories. You have your trash. That's just, all right, do you really need the 50 butter containers, the plastic ones, or the tin foil or anything, because I grew up poor and we saved this stuff. Uh, you just have to learn to part with that. It's very freeing. Then you have your keep pile. This is the things you're going to need when you move to your new place. These you have to keep. This is for your daily living. Then you have your sell or donate. I've found some very creative places to donate things, because if I I found that when things aren't worth much, what's the point of trying to advertise them or whatever? It's a lot of hassle. Do you really want strangers coming to your house to pick up something? Or they say they're going to come and they don't show up. And so I found that donating is much easier and it makes me feel good. Uh, we had a collection of 97 Barbies in boxes, mint condition. And we needed to get rid of quite a few. We donated them to the Ronald McDonald House. They were thrilled. Uh, I had given some to toy drives, things like that. And itemize everything for your taxes. And do it yourself. And then wherever you're donating them, just have them sign it and initial it. Um, then your keepsakes. These are your family treasures. These are the hardest things to figure out what to do with. With my mother, she had a piece of fabric she bought in Hawaii that had a design on it. And we finally, she never made it anymore. She, she quit sewing. We finally framed it and put it on the wall. And it just showed the little design of the fabric. She was, thought it was great. Uh, Things that you can do to try and encourage people is to, again, take pictures and write stories on things. So if you do have to part with that huge bedroom set that no one has a room big enough for, you have a picture of it. And you have the story of where it was. And then if you're lucky enough to know where it went, put that in the book, too. Um, we had a bedroom set that we tried to donate to a historic home in Council Bluffs. And they had seven in storage. And they said, no, we just don't have room for another one. So um, there's a lot of ways to do things. Uh, my mother had a beautiful fur coat. And it had seen better days. But it was her pride and joy. She kept that all her years. And when it finally became kind of worn out, we had it made into a teddy bear. And so you can repurpose your treasures and make them more manageable and make them something that you can do. My big thing is boxes. They have all these wonderful decorative boxes that you can do. And my mother was a quilter. When I opened up a cedar chest, it was full of baby quilts. She used to make them for church. They donated them to hospitals. And then when she wasn't able to do quilting anymore, she kept what she had. 
There have been two grandbabies, or her great grandbabies, born since she passed, and they have gotten quilts from great grandma. And very touching to pass these things on. Um, another project I heard I have not done yet, but I am going to do, is you have that 20 place setting of China. Wow. No one wants China, or if you donate it, it's broken up and made into mosaics and everything else. And so someone said they made boxes. And if, give them two, give them the crystal, a place sitting for two. People will take that and you can say, this is my wedding china, we used it for special occasions, use it on your anniversaries, things like that. And people go, oh, I can handle that little box. Or to make the mystery box for your grandkids and different things. Uh, we finally convinced my mother to start wrapping things up and they were our presents for holidays. And no matter if we wanted them or not, we had to leave with them. <laughs> but she always put a card in why it was important to them and where it came from. And so then at least you felt guilty if you were going to get rid of it or you passed it along to somebody. Um, and it's fun to do these things uh, I went through another cedar chest. I have five cedar chests. Uh, went through another cedar chest, found a dress that my mom had put on. I didn't know the card was there when I got the dress out, and I'm like, uh, never going to fit me. It's about this big around. And I looked at it, and she had written down the date she bought it, where she bought it, and that it was the smallest size dress she had ever owned. <laughs> she kept that 62 years. And I could not part with it. My niece, who is like a size minus two, I sent it to her in New York as a surprise. And I sent her the card, and it was in grandma's handwriting. And she went, oh my gosh. She wore it that weekend out to dinner, and she had so many comments. Um, my parents also collected the Terry Redland prints. I am not a Terry Redland fan. They don't have the value they once had. A woman I worked with loves them. So we did a swap. I gave her the pictures. She made a week's worth of meals for my husband when I was having some surgery. So it worked out great for both of us. I know they went to somebody who would love them. The last item is my mother and I are crafters. We, have t we had tons and tons of crafting. A lot of the things were partially done. Never got around to finishing them. What do you do with those? I had a friend who was a hospice worker, and she took a pickup load of this stuff, and she took it to patients she was working with, and they finished them. And because they were partially done, these people got to finish a project and pass it on. So that's kind of where I'm at. And I have most of my stuff in the back. I tried to get it, pick it up. Hopefully you can read it. I did not get it spell checked or edited. So you're on your own there. Hopefully if you don't understand anything, let me know. Thank you. So over the years, you accumulate a lot of stuff, right? I know just my house that I've lived in for 15 years. Every drawer has probably more stuff than it needs. And every closet has um, stuff and probably boxes in the basement that I don't even know what's in them. So I probably need to follow some of this myself. But um, a few tips to just getting started when you're going through that process and you're thinking of maybe next year or maybe in five years or maybe next month you're going to move to something smaller and you need to get rid of some things. So, whoops. There we go. So first, you know, once you've decided where you're going to go, you know how much space you're going to have. And so really think about how much space. What is that floor plan? Kim talked a lot about, you know, knowing how things will fit and what that space is. And when you're working with a move management company, we can help you with that process as well. And so the, as we help you look at that floor, floor plan and look at the stuff that you have, how is your stuff going to fit? But really identifying what are those pieces, what are those pieces of furniture that are important to you to take? What are those key items for you to take? And what is that space? Um, 
And like Lorraine talked about, everybody has different value on uh, what those items are, and that's why it really is important for you to be involved in that process. And um, having someone that can help and facilitate that proce process is definitely an advantage um, to helping that process go smoothly. Whoops, I forgot the next one. So the second part is distributing your belongings to the appropriate people and places. Um, Lorraine talked about, are there key things that you really want a certain person to have? Will it have meaning to them? Or helping people to understand what that meaning is <clears throat> from your perspective so when you give it to them, they'll understand um, and maybe have meaning as well. So are there family members who want items? Is it pictures? Is it China or parts of China? Is it furniture? Are there other belongings that are special to you that you want to make sure that certain family members get? I know sometimes people find that by tagging them or just putting a little um, sticky note on the back of something so that you remember and that that person will then know this is what you want them to have. Often, I heard a story recently where um, someone said, gosh, you know, grandma offered that to me and my three cousins. Well, then all of a sudden they're all showing up to pick something up and, and nobody knew who exactly was supposed to get it. So by jotting that information down, keeping a list or putting a note on the actual item will help you in that distribution process and help that to go smoothly. And then are there important items that you want to distribute to other places? Are there churches or are there organizations that you have been a part of that maybe something is important? Um, maybe you're a quilter and there's a quilters guild and they do something special with quilts and you want to donate quilts to that organization. So keeping in, keeping in mind, be mindful of what things you, what places you belong and where your belongings um, might have a good fit and that you would feel good about those things going to that place. So then you're gonna determine what happens with the rest of those belongings. Do you need to have some kind of a sale, an estate sale or an auction or a tag sale? Are there things that can go to consignment? Maybe there are things they no longer have, you no longer have need for those or they no longer have value to you, but someone else might have. Or are there just places that they need to be donated? And so kind of talking through um, what those piles are when you keep have your what you're taking with you, what you're keeping and what you're donating. Um, think about are there places that really would be important for you to donate things? The fourth item is handling confidential shred. So a lot of times people have tax returns or employment information and um, many of us probably keep some of that stuff way longer than we need to. So when you're getting to that point of moving and some of that stuff you probably don't need to take with you. So what, um, what are you gonna do with that? And in the day of um, security and information theft and personal identity theft, it's important to make sure that your personal um, paperwork and that confidential information is distributed appropriately. And so just make sure that you check when you're working with a company if they do provide confidential shred and how does that work or what should you do with that paperwork so that you don't have to take it with you and you don't have to run the risk of someone stealing your identity. Then the fifth item is the coordination and coordinate the distribution of the donation. So again, there are so many places that you can donate things to. Just a few that, um, that we had talked about in, in our group were Habitat for Humanity, Restore, Salvation Army, Goodwill, churches. So there are so many options for what to do with that stuff that you no longer need and no one else in your family or friend circle needs and um, making sure that it goes to a place where you feel good about it is important in the process of um, getting rid of your things and makes you feel good. You know that what you have distributed and what you have sent to the various places that you're donating is going to a good place. And of course the landfill is an option in today's uh, state we try to keep as much out of the landfill as we can, so hopefully there are good homes for things to go, um, but that's always a last resort. And with all donation things, just make sure that you're um, documenting, getting receipts, having that signed so that you can um, use that as donation on, on your tax return and uh, that you know where everything went. Thank you. But what they want me to talk about a little bit today, because I am a certified appraiser, 
is, the, is how to value things. And I even brought a show and tell a few things and a loop and just, you know, to show you. But my job is to research and to try to get the most value of, out of the items that you have. I do full estate sales, uh, but we do an exceptional job in terms of research so that we are finding out what the value is. Now, there's so many changes in valuation that you have to keep up with it. Trends change, taste change. Um, old doesn't mean valuable. That's one of the things. Everybody thinks just because it's old, it has a tremendous amount of value. Well, a lot of old things have no value whatsoever. You know, it depends on, there's many variables, but one of the most important is scarcity. If an item is more scarce, less was made, then it's gonna have retain a higher value. In other words, my heart breaks because I've been doing this a long time and I've had people that have put money into collector plates, which used to be the thing, the rage, and you could literally can't give them away now. And you know, a lot of the charities that I work with don't even want them anymore, even for charity. So trends change, but what I'm talking about is that if something is made in volumes, and lots of it, then the value is never gonna stay. It's items that are more rare and scarce. So that's one of the things. Another thing that's important is condition. Condition has everything to do with valuing items. You know, so if something is a really higher end item, it has a specific mark, um, then the condition is a big important part of it because if it's not in good condition, the value is gonna plummet, okay? Now, marks are very important too, and I even brought a few little things here just to show you. Okay, nothing special, but I just want to uh, make a point. Okay, this is something that you always have to have when you do what I do, which is a loop, because marks are relatively small. Now, if something is marked, you have a good head start of where to start your research. Many time, many items, especially older items, don't have marks. That's the challenge. And when you're gonna do something like that, you have to find, just like real estate, you have to find comparables. And you have to do a lot of comparisons of things that would be very similar. But this, thankfully, has a mark. So this one I can actually see almost well enough without my loop, but this one is made, okay. It's made by Royal Dalton. It was a time when, and this is called Muffy. Now, one time, these were really keeping their value. And when I first started the business, if I'd see, you know, any of the Royal Dalton figurines, I'd be very excited. Well, most of them have not kept the value. Things like this are not selling real well. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't sell them but you have to come up with an appropriate, what we call fair market value in order to sell it. You can't compare what you paid for it uh, or anything else. It has to be what the prices are going for in today's market, and that's really important. One of the hardest things that I have to explain to my clients is that you know retail and resale are totally different and i just i mean it's it's that's probably the hardest part i i just had the honor of doing a very big estate sale uh last these lovely people came and bought a chair you know anyways and the owners which were the nicest most lovely people but they had every document every piece of paper every bill everything i mean she had notebooks like this so she showed me what they paid for their carpets. She also showed me an old appraisal. And they actually were gonna give me, you know, prices that they wanted to get for them. And I almost choked. You know, I didn't in front of them, but I almost choked. And basically, they wanted even more than it was appraised for. Now, when you do appraisals, there's many different types of valuation. The highest one, which has nothing to do with real value, is an insurance appraisal. 
And so people will see these appraisals that were done for insurance, which are probably two to three times more than what the, the sale value would be to start with. The market on Persian rugs has gone way down. So luckily, I had an expert that I was able to confer with who they actually had the appraisal done. Uh, and he agreed with me wholeheartedly. And finally, they allowed us to come with a price that was fair to everybody. But also, the whole point is to be able to sell the items. And so we did. We sold two of their magnificent, beautiful Persian rugs because we did the homework. We did the analysis of what the market will prevail in today's market, and we were able to, you know, and everybody was happy, including myself, you know. So basically, it's important to really, and there are no categories when you are individual, when you are looking at an item. It's like you can't say just because I have an old this. Not all of them are valuable. It depends on what the mark is. Again, I brought another mark I want to show you because marks change, and that's one of the things that you have to be familiar with. It's like, for instance, this little thing. Does anyone know what this little thing is? Who made it? It's not the typical looking one. The typical looking one has little clovers on it. Uh huh. I'm old. We're all old. What do you tell? Well, at least this I am. <laughs> okay, Belique. Okay. Now, Belique usually has its, you know, Irish company. It makes very delicate, fine porcelain. This is a different kind, but it's Belique. But Belique, they've changed their marks probably two dozen times. So you can't just say, oh, it's Belique. Okay, well, you have to look and see where the mark is. Is, what color the mark is, what the form of the mark is, what dates that particular mark, you know, so there's a lot to it. You know, you can't generalize when you're trying to come up with the valuation of something. And that's really important because when you take the time, and if people have things that require that, um, you have to be able to do the evaluation, do the research, and really come up with what the items are worth in today's market. You know, and I, I work with everything I do, full estate sale liquidation, but I also do full appraisals. I do appraisals when there's a division of property. Uh, even if the items, I, had, I did one very recently, it broke my heart. This man had everything documented, pictures of everything, the history of who, you know, when they got it. And 90% of the items that were in this notebook the, the value had been almost nothing. I mean, the market is basically nothing on almost all of them, and it's really sad, you know. And luckily, the, the son who brought me, who gave me the work, uh, recognized that and un understood. I said, I'm not selling these things. I am not doing anything. I am just coming up with what we call fair market value to be able to help you so there's a division of property, you know. So, um, Am I? I'm okay. 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 Now I brought another little thing. I don't know where I got these random things in my <laughs> office, but marks, as I said, are very important. Now this is a lot of people don't know anything about costume jewelry, and I always tell everybody, don't throw anything away except garbage, and clear out your personal, you know, items because you don't know what things have value. Now, costume jewelry can be extremely valuable, and it also depends on who made it, if there is a mark, who that specific mark is, what period of time that mark came from, okay? So there's so many variables, you know, that are involved in all of this, but does anybody know this is a very, popular, very uh, sought after name in custom jewelry. She did a lot with Baroque type of pearls. Anybody want to take a guess? Nope. nope. Good guess, but not the right one. Everybody, anybody heard of Miriam Haskell? Ooh, 
Okay, well, Miriam Haskell is one of the names you always, you know, want to look for. But there's hundreds of others. And, you know, the challenge is, is coming up with an evaluation with things, as I said before, that are not marked. And there is a tremendous amount of that. And that's where it takes knowledge and it takes the time. It takes research. It takes books and books. I have a library of, you know, books that I use for evaluation of on every single topic and uh, which are great for identifying but they're not good for pricing you know so bottom line is you want to do your research have a professional you know I don't handle a lot of what these other lovely ladies do I handle the selling and maximizing the price of the items you know that's my specialty okay so anyways thank you Hello, everybody. Thank you guys for coming out. I'm excited that you guys asked me to come and talk a little bit. So um, I have loved everything you guys have said. I've taken a lot of notes, too. So I hope you guys have, too. And we're all willing to stay after if you have any questions or want to talk to anybody more specifically. And a lot of these things that all of these ladies have said can work together as well. You can you know, work with all, all six of us if, you, if that was something that you wanted to do. So just keep that in mind. Um, and like they said, just ask, ask questions all the time. So. What I want to go over is the five things you need to know about the auction method. So, wrong way. There we go. So the first thing, um, you probably, when I say I'm an auctioneer, you probably all have a certain thought in your brain that comes up. I don't look like the typical auctioneer. I'm not wearing a cowboy hat and cowboy boots, um, but I do talk fast. But I actually spend 99% of my time handling online auctions. So that's not something you would normally you would normally think of when you think that I'm an auctioneer. So um, we're working really hard to change that stereotype because that is the word auction has a, a stereotype behind it. It's that it was only good for um, livestock auctions or grandma's big estate sale when she passes away or grandpa's farm equipment. Well, I'm here to tell you that there is a lot of options when it comes to having an auction. And so um, we do offer our company, I say we, I mean, auction companies in general, and there's a lot to choose from. Um, you can have an on-site, live, in-the-yard auction like you're all thinking of, where there's an auctioneer standing up there and they're calling out numbers on a Saturday afternoon. Or um, the fastest growing segment in the auction industry is what we call online-only auctions. And the best way I can explain this to someone who doesn't know what that is, is it's similar to eBay. So um, basically, there's no on-site bidding at all. There's no people in the crowd. Everything happens over the internet. Um, and so that is a really huge growing portion of our company and the auction industry in general. So that's great for people who are downsizing, who maybe don't want to deal with, um, excuse me, want to deal with uh, a big crowd of people in their yard. Maybe you don't have room for something like that, or you don't have enough stuff for something like that. So online auctions are a great option there. The other thing that you can um, utilize is these different options that combine the two. So a live auction combined with some sort of online bidding as well. So there's online and live simulcast auctions. So this uh, would be like, for instance, last weekend we had a live auction of construction equipment. It was on the grounds there, but we also offered online bidding for people who couldn't be there in person. And that works in a lot of situations depending on the asset type. Um, or we'll offer online pre-bidding, which basically only eliminates the online bidding during the live auction. So this, so uh, for instance, we have an auction tonight. We're selling a piece of real estate and we are selling it at the property this evening at six o'clock, but we've offered pre-bidding online on that property for the last two weeks. So there's different options to incorporate online bidding, live bidding, you know, so um, keep those uh, thoughts open. We also, I mean, real estate auctions are always something People don't always think of as an option for an auction, but it is something that is available if you're interested in that. So just keep that in mind. The second thing you need to know about auctions that, and this is coming from me, my opinion here, I think auctions are the absolute best way to establish market price. Um, you cannot get any better, more true of a value than if you have two people or more, a minimum of two people bidding on an item and through the competitive bidding process because you're guaranteed to either reach the maximum value of that property at that time, whatever it is, whatever the asset is, or you're going to go way higher than that because you have the competition aspect and you're going to go to the point at which someone is willing to stop bidding. So um, yes, like Cheryl said, the dollar sign may not be exactly what you were hoping for or what you were wanting, but it's true market value on that day and you can't argue. As long as you've advertised properly and you've gotten the people there who are interested in that 
that asset or that or that home or whatever it may be, you're going to establish true market value on that day. Um, so the other thing that goes in lo along with that. Um, we do have low starting prices. We don't set prices on things. That's how auctions work. You, you can get into reserves, and that's something that's a separate conversation. But in general, an auctioneer stands up there, and they ask for $10 to start on this, and everybody in the, in the room is going to raise their hand until there's only one person left. And that's the person that's willing to pay the most for that asset at that time. And so in my opinion, that's, that's, um, that ends up working out good for the seller because you don't set a ceiling at all in your items. You're not saying this is the price and this is what I'm asking because what if somebody comes along 10 minutes later who says, well, I'd have given you way more for that. So that's just something to keep in mind um, if you're interested in that. Um, there's no waiting. So an auction is an auction. When it ends, it ends and the item is sold and it's gone and you're done and you don't have to deal with offers. You don't have to wait months and months for, for something to sell. So usually it's regardless of price at absolute auction, the items are gone. And so if, in our opinion, if you're wanting to sell, for instance, if you guys are moving and you need all of the furniture in your house gone, your main goal is to get your house empty before you move. And so there are probably going to be things that maybe you are disappointed with in the price, but there's going to be other things that, you're, that greatly exceeded your expectations. So um, the end goal is that you will have an empty house. You'll, have, you'll be ready to go. Um, we can sell anything at all. So number three. An online auction, or excuse me, that's me talking, that's my business here. An auction, in general, can happen on your timeline. So um, we have clients that can call us and say, I have to be out of my house in two and a half weeks, and we can make that work. It's a little bit harder. Obviously, it is. We have to look at schedules and things like that, but we can facilitate an auction in two to three weeks and have everything done and have a check in your hand. So that's pretty fast for people who, are, who work on a fast time. I mean, sometimes people put their house up on the market and they get an offer tomorrow, and they've got to have it empty in 30 days. They don't have a choice. It's, they've got to go. So this can be very fast. And then we have other people who call us and say, well, we're planning on moving south in about two years, so we just want to get the process started. What do we need to do? And I'd say, okay, call us in six months, and we'll talk again. Or just start sorting, you know, like some of these ladies have said. Go through the things that you know you don't want to take and start a, start a room that's just the cell room or something like that. So we have people that can plan it out that far in advance. Or, um, for instance, like if your grandma and grandpa are moving from their farm auction, you might have two or three different auctions. We'll sell... We'll sell a farm equipment auction, and then we'll sell a personal property auction, and then we might even sell the real estate. So there's a whole bunch of different things, and if you, if you do give us a little bit more time, sometimes we can um, piece those out, and you can have two or three different asset type auctions. Um, something that we do uh, particularly, and I've kind of mentioned that, is for instance, like if someone is selling their home, we can come in and we can do the inventory or the listing for an auction ahead of time so that as soon as you do get that offer or, or the, the um, process starts taking, taking action, that we already have that long process of inventorying done and we basically can just flip the switch and it can go up on our website or the auction can be started. Uh, the other thing that works good is we can schedule back from a certain date. So it goes along with everything I was just saying. So you say, okay, we've got 60 days that we need to be out of the house, but we'd really like to have our furniture until the last possible day. So I say, okay, so your move out date is August 31st. You want the house cleaned out by the 29th. We need two weeks to do our auction. So that means we need to start it here and we just work backwards and we, and we can set the dates accordingly. So an auction can work on your timeline. As long as, you, as long as you're a little bit flexible and can work with our schedule, it can happen fairly quickly. Number four, I've touched on this already a little bit. Um, everything is sold. There's no leftovers. And um, I know that this is sometimes a little hard to swallow, but sometimes it's, it's a, it, more often than not, people are very happy that the end result is that their house is empty. And they've, they've gotten that goal of getting everything out. And um, you can look over the list of all your items and you might say, well, shoot, I spent more on that table than I got. But in the end, you're going to say, I didn't have to deal with it through another method. I didn't have to go you know, back and try and sell it again. Or um, just two weeks ago, I had a, a lady who was selling, moving south, and she had to have her stuff out in a month. And she wanted to sell her Thunderbird. And I convinced her into selling her windmill, like a, a big farm windmill. And she wanted $3,000 out of her Thunderbird. And I'm like, OK, we'll try. Well, we only got two. And the windmill brought three times more than she wanted. So she called me up the next day. And she's like, sell a car. I don't want it. I'm, I just want to be done. I want everything gone. I don't want to have to put a sign on it. I don't want to have to deal with anybody knocking on my door. So she was willing in that scenario to take a little bit less on one thing because she got more on the other. So 
that that can be negotiated and that can work out. But auctions do that. There are things that are going to go way higher than you think, and there are things that are going to go lower. We're not going to sugarcoat it and say that there aren't. And like Cheryl said, there are things that you're going to have a lot of emotional value and sentimental value to that aren't going to have that value to anyone else. And so you have to say, I, I will honestly tell people, I say, if if this set of china means that much to you, don't sell it at auction because you're going to be disappointed. You know, I, I'll tell them, I'm like, it's not going to bring what you want it to bring. And if you're going to be sad to see it go for that for $5, then don't sell it. Keep it, give it to someone, donate it, whatever is going to make you feel best. So um, let's see here. Am I getting everything I said? said I didn't have anything. Yep, per no loose ends. Everything is sold. There's no leftovers. We very, very rarely have anything that doesn't sell on our auctions. If it doesn't sell, you get a dumpster, you throw it away. If, if there's no value for it, nobody is willing to pay $5, then it's not worth doing anything with, in our opinion. That's what we usually tell. And then the last thing that I will say is, <laughs> um, I'm an auctioneer, I can't talk fast enough, I guess. <clears throat> you can sell anything at auction. So a lot of people will call us and they'll say, well, I've got five or six things that I want to sell and I'm going to, you know, you guys don't want to deal with all this little stuff. You, I got the, you can sell my antique furniture, but you don't want to deal with my kitchen cupboards. We can sell anything, you guys. The high price stuff isn't going to deter the low price stuff. I always tell people the more the better. If you can have a nice, big, well-rounded auction, then you're going to get more buyers. You're going to get more eyes on your items. You're going to get more exposure. So um, we can everything that's listed up there, <laughs> we can sell it all. Um, it, it all has a, a method or a way to be sold at auction. And um, if you're if if you're truly wanting to sell your items or sell your things, then auction is a really good option for you. And it might be something that's worth talking about. And it can, it can happen fairly quickly. So um, I'd love to talk with you if anybody has any questions or anyone else for that matter. Um, we've got, we all have brochures in the back. So thank you guys. All right, well, thank you to our speakers. And I think you moved me ahead here. Question, so we want to make sure that we get as many questions out there as possible for, for folks. So anybody have any? His question was, you promised an empty house, but there are things that you can't sell. Will you get rid of those at the beginning? I will not promise an empty house. That is one thing I will not do because there are things that don't sell and we don't clean out houses. So that's, that's probably something maybe some of these other ladies might offer or would help you with. But our job is to sell the things that have value. And so we'll tell you at the very beginning if, if it doesn't have value, and that was one of my slides I had up there, there are just some things that we can't, we really can't turn over. We can't, old TVs, dirty mattresses, b broken furniture. I mean, we're just gonna tell you from the beginning there's no point in us trying to sell this. You might as well have it cleaned out. So um, if I'm saying the stuff that we offer for sale, 99% of it will sell. You might have a couple things left over that we didn't get bids on that we tried to sell, but that, that was what I was meaning by that. Thank you. So the question just uh, is just re involving uh, what kind of costs and fees are associated with each of um, the services. So yeah, if you guys don't mind, kind of just, yeah, Cheryl. Okay. But Here, use that microphone though, because otherwise we won't pick it up. I wanted to uh, add one more thing about if you're gonna choose to donate something to a museum, you have to have it appraised because if you want a tax write-off, although the tax laws have changed tremendously, uh, we're not going to benefit anywhere the way we used to from our donations, so please check with your tax attorney or accountant. But in order to get a tax benefit, if you are going to donate something to a museum, you have to have an appraised value. She was just saying, in case that cut out for some of you, just to make sure you get an appraised value if you are looking to donate something to a museum. So back to the question about costs and fees. If you guys don't mind, just kind of as yeah. generic I'll, as you can. Since I'm on the end, I'll just yeah. touch on it. Um, I didn't I didn't say anything just because it's, it is very specific on a per sale basis. Um, I will say generally there is a commission as far as an auction goes. That's something that is a standard procedure, and that's going to be different for everybody. And I would... I would say any of us would be willing to talk to you individually about your personal um, situation. But yeah, it's for us, for an auction, I can say normally it's a commission, but that also will change. Oh, no, I just, okay. Um, same thing. It's basically I do charge a percentage of what I sell. There are no fees ahead of time. Uh, other than once in a great while, 
we have to charge if there's a clean out for instance we're doing a hoarder's house right now um, but normally it's a percentage of what we're able to sell and if it can be in a sliding scale depending on what the items are and the value of the items and that's inclusive of everything from labor to set up to cleaning to you know getting everything out of it's everything Okay, for the moves, I kind of give people estimates, but again, everybody, every senior move manager is different as far as the company you go to. Um, I always say if you're moving to a one bedroom, it could go between 25 to 3,000. That includes your actual mover, that includes the floor plan, the packing, the actual mover, all the moving supplies, um, and then also your resettling. Oh, everything is, am I still there? Everything's included. That also, um, if you go into a two bedroom, it's, I say 35 to four, and then kind of keep going up. Again, completely depends on what you have, because there's times when I've done a one bedroom for you know $900. So it all depends on how much stuff that needs to be packed for them. Um, the rates, I think people are all different out there from I think maybe 55 to $75 an hour, it depends on on who they are and what they what they do. So does that help a little bit? Okay. And kind of just to add on to what Kim talked about from that range of price, just keep in mind and make sure that you ask. So if you're working with or you're talking with a couple different companies, just make sure you ask and um, have them know, you know, like I talked about the confidential shred. Is there a charge to do that confidential shred or is that something that's included? Um, is there a cost to bring a dumpster in or is that something that's included? So just make sure that you talk through um, all of those and ask those questions when you're working with people so that you know um, up front, is it all included or am I going to have additional charges after the fact? As far as the moves go, um, once you get the final document or once you get your invoice, do we expect tips? No. Honestly, I, people have offered money, and I'd say no, because this is we enjoy what we do. We do it because we're there to help, and no, we don't want. I mean, I personally, this might, we don't accept tips. I just counted on it, but I did. You did accept that? I mean, you did. They were expecting tips. Interesting. Really. The actual movers then? The actual movers themselves. Hmm. No. I I use like five different movers and no, I don't. I mean, we've never done, I came across that. Interesting. So maybe ask that. If you have a move manager, does your <laughs> actual movers expect tips? Okay. The tip is we hired them. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so the housing action team has been sponsoring these luncheons and our next one is september 12th here and it is about the resources in the community to help you stay in your home and it will again start 11 30 and and finish up by one you're welcome to attend um i think i know on the next slide yeah so collins community credit union will be sponsoring it next um, month and these are our sponsors that we've had for the different luncheons. Again, I want to thank um, Hills Bank today. I want to thank um, ICAR. I forgot to thank them. They allow us to use their space, and of course, they're so helpful with everything. So um, thank you to the Iowa City Area Association of Realtors. And of course, Jeff Kalbach, which I didn't say, you're the aging specialist. You didn't really say that. He has a position at the county and he's available as a resource, and it's a new position. Well, I call it new, but he says not um, at the county. But anyway, that's what Jeff's position is. And, of course, um, Monica and Jane for arranging all of this. And, I, and we, I, we have several housing action team members here, so thanks to the group that uh, meet to be able to put this on. Thank you all again for attending. Thank you to our speakers. Thanks to Hills Bank. Um, and we we'll hope to see many of you next month. Yeah.